Hello, everybody. Next up, we have Kluash with Here Be Dragons Ghidra Decompiler API Adventures. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So just a few quick remarks before we go into the, into the details. Uh, the talk is not going to be about Ghidra in general. So if you have no knowledge about Ghidra, this pro talk is probably going to be a bit hard to follow. Uh, if you want to learn more about Ghidra or how to learn Gid how to use Ghidra in a, in a basic way, uh, you can also hit me up afterwards if you're still around. Uh, that's perfectly fine. If you uh, want to get started with Ghidra on your own, uh, Ghidra also has a lot of introductory materials, also um, in relation to the, to like expert stuff, like API stuff, internals, and so on. Uh, and you can find it in in the installation folder on the docs and Ghidra class. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of stuff, which usually covers more than your average YouTube tutorial covers. Uh, and these are actually very good re resources. You just rarely see them linked. Uh, I'm, I wrote that you'll be able to see the slides later on this link, but you should already be able to download the slides from there. Uh, there is also a link to the example code that I'm going to use in uh, the presentation as well. Okay. So the main idea behind the talk is that we want to look into the decompiler itself, which is like a C++ binary. Um, and there's not really any good resources on how to get into contributing to the decompiler itself or how you could extend it on your own. When we look at Gidra, Gidra is kind of split into two big code bases, the Java component and the C++ component. The Java uh, client kind of has the UI and has all the easy stuff, let's say it like that. It has the program database. It has the loaders for the file formats. For example, if you implement an ELF loader or if you want to implement a loader for a certain firmware format, uh, then you can do that in Java. Uh, you can extend almost everything in Java except for the decompiler with one or two uh, uh, possibilities, maybe. So the, the C++ code is used for the heavy lifting, which is the decompilation self. Uh, and Slay. I'm going to get into uh, what Slay is in a second. Uh, in general, these run as separate processes because Gidra has the policy that you don't use uh, GNI because they don't want you to crash the whole uh, program if your memory unsafe code crashes. Uh, and the Gidra decompiler is kind of prone to crash. You don't notice because they're actually catching the sec faults and throwing an exception. Uh, so when the decompiler crashes, you might have a sec fault. Uh, they don't want anything else to crash, so everything that is not Java has to run as a separate process. Therefore, they also use like uh, inter-process communication. They just open a pipe between the, uh, bet between the program and Java, uh, and they're communicating back and forth, uh, sometimes binary, most of the times in XML. This also means that the decompiler itself, uh, the way it's used inside of Ghidra when you run the, the Ghidra program, it has to replicate and kind of cache the state that you already have in Ghidra because the decompiler doesn't have it on its own. Uh, and sometimes it's also intended that the decompiler itself does not have this information unless you use it in a different way. If you want to get started into working with the decompiler itself or with the API, uh, it's C++, but if you know Java, you will be fine because it is very much written like Java. Uh, it has lots of iterators all over the place. Uh, and has a lot of inheritance. Um, if you like modern C++, I have to disappoint you because it's using uh, C++ 11. Um, so you don't have to know any special new C++ features. It is really very similar to Java. We can, we can take a look later. It also has minimal dependencies. Uh, when it is distributed, it is actually built with Gradle. But for development, they just have a make file. Uh, which is unfortunate for most of Windows users, but is uh, pretty co uh, comfortable for Linux users because you can just run make for whatever you want to build, and it will just build. Uh, until recently, they had no dependencies at all. Like They also added their own XML parser uh, just so that they don't have any dependencies that don't come with like uh, basic Linux installations. Uh, now they have added uh, Zlib, because they wanted to compress uh, some stuff. 
and they also vendored it, so you, you don't need to have it installed on your system. You, they just have the C++ files dropped in. So it's also just compiled and like a self-contained package that you can just build. In the examples that I have uploaded, uh, and then I'm going to show, I used a Mison project. This should also work on Windows. I haven't tested it, but theoretically it's platform independent. So you should be able to build it with uh, Visual Studio. When we take a look at how we can extend Ghidra, uh, there is Python scripting support, but it's kind of a second class citizen because it's only uh, Jython, so it's a, a Java interpreter of Python. There are several projects that try to integrate modern Python support or like actually useful Python support into Ghidra. You should check them out, like there's Ghidra Bridge, uh, just search for Ghidra Bridge and you will find other things. I haven't found one that uh, worked satisfactory for me yet, so mostly when I'm trying to extend Ghidra, I'm just sticking to Java because that is the main supported thing. You can write scripts, uh, you can write the image loaders, you can write uh, anal anal analyzers, uh, also exporters. Pretty much everything that you see in the UI you can uh, customize with an extension. And if you install Gidra, you can find the uh, skeleton for the extension development under extension Gidra skeleton. Uh, and then it will have like template files for everything that you can extend. Because the decompiler is a separate C++ pro program, you don't really have uh, uh, means to extend that through the Java API. There is one exception, uh, and that is a bit of a special case. Because if you define certain user-defined operations uh, in the slay definitions and the p-code, again, I'm going to talk about this in a second, then you can, uh, the decompiler will call back to the Java UI where user-injected code will be executed, which will then be passed back to, to the decompiler. So in that special case, you can actually modify some things of the decompiler, but you will still not get uh, full control over everything. When you look at the source code repo on, on GitHub, or if you just uh, download the source and look at it locally, you can find the decompiler under this path here. Uh, it's pretty deep down, but everything you need uh, for the decompiler to run, like all the C++ files are there. As I mentioned earlier, for the build workflow for development, you can just run make. Uh, and if you actually want to package Gidra, uh, you have to use the Gradle file. When we look ahead what uh, targets we have in the make file, there are many targets there, but not all of them are used in like a typical Gitra distribution. Like some of them are also just for development purposes. We have the integrated decompiler, uh, which is the Gitra uh, DBG or also decompile. We have the integrated slay uh, interpreter. We have a command line decompiler, which is called decomp DBG. Uh, I'll show that also off later. There is a test driver for unit and data tests, although the unit and data tests are not really well maintained. Uh, I just tried to run them from the GitHub repo and they would not reasonably work for me. Uh, so I'm not sure if anyone is actually maintaining these tests. And then you can also have the, the uh, two important parts, Slay and, uh, and, decom and the decompiler as libraries that you can just link to your programs. Out of these, only two are shipped with Gidra, actually. Uh, one is Gidra Opt, which is the, the integrated decompiler. Inside of Gidra, it's called decompile or decompile.exe. Uh, and Slay, which corresponds to the optimized build of Slay. Now we're finally uh, coming to what Slay actually is. Slay is a description language. I'm not going to go into detail of how this works, because like talking about Slay would probably be a, Another 60-minute talk, probably also 120-minute talk. Uh, it's very complicated, but it allows you pretty much uh, to describe all architectures that you could think of. I imagine with certain limitations for weird architectures. Uh, but pretty much all architectures you can think of can be described with Slay in some sort of uh, description files. And they are compiled into .sla files. And then the .sla file that is shipped with Gidra is like the package of the architecture description that is just loaded. And it's like uh, on the fly translating uh, the bytes uh, and also lifting the bytes uh, to p-code. So Slay is disassembling. And it's also 
uh, describing the semantics of the, of the operations so that they can lift it to P code, uh, which is the intermediate representation that Gidra uses internally for architecture independent analysis. Every program that is uh, loaded into Gidra is through Slay translated to P code. When we start off, uh, this is a one to many mapping. So you take one instruction, you disassemble it, and then uh, using the semantics, you uh, generate multiple P code instructions that correspond to the semantics of that. And initially, this is a, an exact mapping. So if there was no human error in the architecture description, then this should be uh, a 100% correct mapping of instructions to P code that actually map the semantics of, of what the instruction is doing. Uh, however, this kind of then gets a bit lost through the decompiler transformations. Uh, and the decompiler is not that stringent with making sure that the decompiled code is actually correct in the end. Uh, through the process of transforming the P code, we, we call this high level P code, uh, mainly because uh, we are introducing new P code operations that are not present before. Uh, and we are throwing out other P code operations that are no longer needed. Uh, there is no real textual uh, re representation of P code, so you can't really format it nicely. You can't really export it nicely. As I said earlier, Gidra internally uses XML, so that's the closest to the textual represent representation of a P code that you get. Other than that, P codes, uh, P code operations are only represented uh, as the C++ or Java objects internally. Uh, so they're just meant to be used programmatically, uh, and you can't really send them outside of a program or back. You just link to uh, either the Java code or the C++ code, uh, which have pretty much copied code for both the P code uh, operations on the C++ side and the Java side. So we have uh, the two main building blocks, which is a P code op, the, the actual operation. And the operation takes operands, and these operands are represented as var nodes. Or like the object type is var node. Uh, what operations do we have? We actually don't have that many operations. Like, there is more than that, but it's like maybe uh, like I think the IDs go up to 60. I'm not sure if there's that many uh, operations. But uh, we have like typical memory operations. We have load store. We have copy like a move. Uh, we have branching instructions, call instructions, conditional branches. We have inter integer arithmetic. Uh, we also have floating point arithmetic. Uh, and then we have high-level P code operations uh, like multi-equal or indirect that are only introduced through program transformations. The operands of P code, the var nodes, uh, are a bit of a, an interesting concept because they need to represent every possible input. So you could have a constant, you could have a memory address, you could have uh, some arbitrary C++ object, uh, which is what the Gidra decompiler is actually doing. So sometimes you just have a, an address that you need to cast to the corresponding uh, internal decompiler object. And the way it's, it does that is not uh, as you would think through, through inheritance, like you're not having subclasses of R node that represent the different types, uh, but it's a bit more, uh, you have a bit more freedom in, into actually using that because the inputs are specified using address spaces. So a var node gets assigned a certain address space, and then the offset into that address space represents the value that you actually have. So if you have a constant value, uh, like just an integer loaded into a register, uh, this would be stored into the constant address space, and the offset into this address space would be uh, the actual constant value. Or if you have a local variable, uh, you use the stack address space, uh, and then as I said, there's also uh, internal decompiler objects, which just use the, the address space as kind of a type tag and then you have the, the pointer to the C++ object as the value. Uh, there is no option to show high-level P code in Gidra directly. Uh, it's not hard to write a quick script. Uh, I, I've, I've linked one that is used by or that was published by NCC Group. I can also maybe show it here. I'm not going to run the script uh, right now because when I did the 10 minutes earlier, everything crashed on my PC and it froze, so I'm not going to do that again. Uh, but we have another way of, of actually kind of viewing the high-level P code. When we are inside Gidra and we have a decompiled uh, program, we can also use this small 
uh, icon here and then uh, go to debug function decompilation. Uh, and that will allow you to save uh, an XML file. which then contains all the, the information that is actually uh, represented through the decompiled code. We can take a look. It should be pretty large. Oh, it's actually not even that large. Uh, and someone published a tool that uh, where you can actually go ahead and visualize this. Uh, I have the link on the tool on, on a slide later, but I'm just uh, moving ahead a bit. Okay, so it's pretty small. I can zoom in, actually. Uh, but the text here is a bit small. So on the, on the top left, we have the different stages of the, of the decompilation process. Uh, I'm going to explain these as well. If we just go to the last uh, stage, we can here see uh, the P code that is actually being left over. We can copy this into a file. So this is what the, what the high-level P code looks like. Uh, it doesn't make much sense just from the textual description because uh, that there is no official textual description, so the decompiler just puts out something. But you can see here, for example, that uh, this is supposed to be an assignment to a stack address. So here we have a stack address, uh, and here we have the assignment to this value. But other than that, it's, it is not very it, readable in this form. The high P code is also in static single assignment form, which means uh, you have every, every variable is only being assigned once. So whenever you tr make a new assignment or change the value of a variable, you introduce a new variable, uh, a new var node. And then this, this uh, state is maintained until the end of the decompilation process. Yeah, you also have the, the P code instruction multi equal because if you have branches, then you need to merge the, the variable, the possible values for the uh, variables again. And the multi equal instruction does uh, exactly that. It takes two var nodes or more var nodes uh, representing the values uh, and produces a new variable as an assignment. In general, sometimes you might also get decompilation errors because a function prototype might not be exact enough. And Ghidra is typically very, uh, very extreme in eliminating unused code. So if, if, the, if the variable is actually not consumed, it will just be erased, and you will not see a trace of it either in high P code or in the decompiled code. And then you actually have to go ahead and, and debug where this was removed if you don't know uh, why, why it disappeared. Most of the times, values like that disappear because a, a function prototype is not correct. Like, uh, for example, a function accepting three parameters, and Ghidra guessed that it accepts zero parameters, and then it can't derive that uh, certain values are being consumed and assumes they are not used. Another case could be as, for example, uh, if you have reverse engineered the Balcom batch with, with Ghidra, uh, or like embedded code in general, is if you have uh, regions that are like I.O. regions marked in C as volatile, you actually need to do so in Gitter as well, because otherwise it will just eliminate the code as a normal compiler would do as well. The decompiler actually has document documentation. Uh, it is somewhat extensive. That is, you can go through the code, uh, through the doxygen, and read uh, the descriptions there, and most of the times it's really helpful. However, uh, it doesn't really give a very good overall picture, but you still need the documentation to get something done at all. 
Uh, this isn't as widely host hosted as the Java doc because people usually just extend Gitra using the Java doc. Uh, we uh, also uploaded it, or I uploaded it. It should be reachable under this address. Uh, and I also put the nice theme on it, so it's a bit easier on the eyes than normal Tadoxygen documentation. Yeah, this talk is kind of meant to give you an entry point into the, the big picture of how the decompiler works, so that in combination with that and the, the documentation itself, you can hopefully make uh, changes that you want. Okay, so how do we use the decompiler or what can we do with the decompiled code? Uh, because everything is open source and Gidra has all these architecture definitions in Slay, it is very useful for us to integrate the decompiler into other tools, for example, like uh, Radar uh, or Ryzen. Do, they just imp uh, included the decompilation process. You can also do the same with the disassemblers uh, and the p-code lifting itself. And there are uh, also many, many research projects that try to either rewrite Slay uh, to make it a bit faster or integrate it into other tools. Because we have all these architecture definitions basically for free lying around uh, and people maintaining them. So that's pretty useful. Uh, and then we can also extend and modify the decompiler compatibilities inside Gidra itself so that we can uh, influence the decompilation process from the UI even if you don't want to use the Java UI, it is pretty useful, mainly because there's not really an alternative, maybe, maybe if you look at, at Kata or something like that. But uh, basically, when, when using Gidri, we're stuck with the Java UI, at least for a very good while. So we might still want to extend the decompiler inside Gidra itself. The first building block that we're going to look at in the API is translate. Translate is the interface that does the, the disassembly uh, and the p-code lifting, and Slay implements this interface. Uh, this basically has two relevant functions for us. Uh, one instruction, which takes one instruction and translate and generates p-code out of it, and print assembly, which takes one instruction and just prints the assembly. So the, the idea is that we go ahead and take Slay, the Slay object, which is an implementation of Translate, uh, lo load the SLA descriptions into it, and then use it uh, to disassemble or lift to Pico. Like I said, we need the SLA files. Uh, where can we get them from? Uh, they are located in, in Gidra processes, uh, and then specific to the architecture and data languages. So we can just check. in the Gidra installation folder. And here we can see all the SLA files that are available, like uh, 6502, uh, ARCH64, ARM, uh, x86, somewhere in the bottom, uh, RISC-5. And we can just copy this file uh, and then load it with the Slay class. Uh, and that looks like that. It is a bit, it is a tiny bit more complicated because we uh, can't just load the file because now it's uh, been compressed since the last version. Uh, but we need to do the following. We kind of uh, send an XML command as the Gidra UI would do as well. We just tell it the path uh, where we want to load the SLA file from. And then we say uh, doc storage parse document, which is the, uh, the XML parser that is inbuilt into the Gidra code. Uh, register the root and then initialize Slay with this file. Unfortunately, not, or fortunately, unfortunately, uh, not all information that is needed to actually disassemble correctly is stored in the SLA files because the SLA files are meant to be um, a superset of the information that an instruction set architecture contains. So we will actually have to go and look at a PSpec file which specifies the actual processor. For example, in x86, this means uh, we have one file, one SLA file for x86, but we need to specify a context whether we want to disassemble 16-bit, 32-bit, or 64-bit. 
uh, the way this happens is with a context internal uh, class. So this looks relatively meaningless, or at least, or at least it was relatively meaningless for me at first, because it says address size two, and it doesn't really make sense if I want to disassemble like 64-bit code, address size two, maybe four, maybe eight would make more sense, uh, or op size, uh, or x prefix. So where do these values come from that you need to set in the context? They come exactly from the pspec files. So if we go ahead and look at xe664.pspec, we can see here the context variables, and these are the exact things that you need to set. So if you, want to, if you don't want to parse the whole pspec file, you can just open it in an editor, look at the context variables, and take these and set these manually in your code. Then we need uh, a load image. Load image is basically where we get the data from. The main function is called load fill, uh, which gets an address and a size, and you need to return it something. So if you want to load a raw file, uh, you pretty much just go ahead, load the file into memory, and then uh, when Slay requests through load fill that it needs some bytes at a certain address, you can go ahead and just do a mem copy, pretty much. There are several implementations that are already existing inside Gidra. One is load image uh, XML, which is the debug XML file format that we've seen earlier. Uh, so this load image will load these XML files. The load image Gidra, which is uh, a combination with the uh, Java client, which will just do RPC calls to fetch the data from the, from the Java client. And then there's also a uh, raw load image, which uh, fetches data from a raw binary. Uh, then in order to do anything, we can either have p-code emitted or we can have assembly emitted. Uh, and then we just need to implement the assembly, assembly emit interface, which has one important function, that is dump. Uh, and dump passes you as parameters address, uh, mnemonic, and the operand string. So this is pretty much the simplest uh, assembly emitting interface that you can do, or like almost the simplest. We uh, get address, monomic, and the instruction, the instruction operands, and we can just print it out on the command line. We can also do that uh, with pcode emit, which is just uh, equivalent to, to the pcode lifting instead of assembly. Uh, it's a bit more complicated because it doesn't give us the final pcode operand object. It gives us the building part so that we can build it ourselves, but the pcode obje uh, code operand object itself is going to be uh, created by uh, by a different class later. What do we get uh, as an argument here? We get again the address of the machine instruction. Whenever we have uh, a pcode operand, a pcode operation in Gidra, it will always have the address attached where it came from in the machine code, which is why we can do the, the highlighting things in Gidra where we can just highlight in the decompiled code, and we will roughly see which uh, instructions correspond to it in the assembly. This is because every line here kind of has the, the region that's attached. OK, what does it look like when I put this together? Uh, finally, we just need to do a loop uh, over the addresses that we want to print. Uh, we just take the uh, one address and then the last address. Uh, and then loop over it and throw this into, into Slay and call print assembly. I have this in the example code that I linked in the beginning. Here is the raw loader. Uh, it pretty much just loads a file into memory. Then uh, the load fill does pretty much a manual mem copy. The, the only thing uh, that Gidra requires you to do is even if you pass an invalid address that you can't serve, you should just return zero instead of 
failing. Then the assembly emitter, which fit onto the slide is in its entirely. So here we uh, use our loader to load the, the dump. This is the dump from the, the Balcon badge. Uh, we have the, the context, the document storage, and initialize Slay. We load the SLA file into Slay. We set the context variables for the RISC-V processor. And then here we have our assembly loop. And if everything works, okay, this is already compiled. Here I have my SLA file and the firmware dump. Uh, and this assembles the first this disassembles the first few instructions of the main routine. So this works somewhat easily. Now there's uh, a bit of a step up. Some some things get easier when you move on to the compilation. Some things get a bit more uh, a bit harder because typically you need to. Uh, add more, more information like uh, type information and symbol information. But if you don't want that, you can actually build uh, a relatively simple decompilation interface. Uh, and the way this works is through an architecture object. The architecture object is a wrapper, which contains pretty much, okay. Uh, I'm gonna explain the architecture in detail uh, on the next slide, I think. The load image is still needed. You can also add uh, symbol information now. This means if you have symbol information on your file, you can uh, add that to the load image. If you want to implement your own load image or your architecture, you can also take in, uh, inspiration from the tools that are inside Gidra already. That is the, the decomp debugger and the, the test driver. Even if the tests don't work, uh, the code in general shows you how you would be able to, to run the decompiler if the tests were working. Uh, and all of this is wrapped inside libdecomp, uh, which is just the, the, the static library that contains all the interfaces that are needed for decompilation. How does decompilation work on a general level? Everything on, on Gidra works on a function level, so we need to define a function first where we want to start to decompile. Then we need to recover the control flow, then actually run the decompilation process where we modify the P code to, to make it more readable. And then finally, in the end, we print the C code or uh, whatever other code we want to print. Yeah, GitHub provides the, the symbol information from the Java client. If we don't have the Java client running, we need to add the symbols ourselves if we want symbols. Sometimes we need symbols, in a certain manner. If we want to add uh, symbols to load image, it's just pretty much three um, methods that we have to implement. We have uh, open symbols, close symbols, and get next symbols. This is pretty much just a straightforward iterator. Uh, and it's used to load the, the symbols from the file, for example, from an ELF file into the architecture object. Uh, but this is not necessary for like basic decompilation if you just want to play around with it. Now we can uh, look at the architecture in detail. Uh, this is kind of the main instance of the decompiler. When you start the decompiler and you load an, an SLA file, uh, the architecture is, is, represents the current program that you have open. It caches information about the binary. It contains information about the memory map. It has the translator. That means the architecture takes care of loading slay for you. Uh, it has the load image. And it has all the decompilation actions inside as well. Uh, and also type information, prototypes, pretty much everything that you need that is not specific to a certain function but, or like in a global context. And yeah, you, you have, uh, for example, the architecture Gidra, which is an implementation of the architecture interface, which uses RPC to fetch uh, the data from the Java client. We can also use the Slay architecture instead, which will just uh, Use, this, use, use Slay directly and load the SLA file, because normally when you run Gidra uh, as a Java client, it does the, the Slay, it does the lifting and the disassembly in a separate process, and then passes this information to the, to the decompiler. 
so that the, because the decompiler is somewhat short-lived and all the program database information is stored in the client on the Java side. So you want to do the de disassembly and the lifting first, store it in the program information, in the program database, and then access it uh, on the decompiler when it starts. <coughs> These are the three things that we need to implement or that are like good to implement at a minimum. We need to initialize our loader somewhere, which is the build loader function. Uh, the collect spec files is just uh, from uh, the, sp uh, the specification files uh, should be for the slay uh, spec files. Then you have resolve architecture where you could do, uh, where you could guess which architecture the binary actually is. But uh, in our case, we know that we, know we have a fixed architecture. Uh, and you have post spec file, which is executed after the SLA file has loaded. So after everything is initialized, you could uh, use the post spec file to pass uh, information, for example, to your loader if you need any more. In comparison to the, to the architecture object, we also have func data, which is the representation of one function. Uh, and the func data object stores pretty much everything else that is specific to a function. So Ghidra has to pick, has to start with a function somewhere and it compiles uh, the whole, decompiles the whole binary one function at a time. So it needs to define a function first, then it will do the lifting, it will do the jump, uh, jump table analysis, and then it will try to identify more functions. Func data uh, also has all the p-code operations and the varnode objects. So if you want to add or remove p-code operations uh, when you rewrite stuff, you need to actually go for func data because otherwise uh, the cache is no longer uh, working correctly and other uh, rewriting operations won't work properly or like most likely sec fault. We also have other information like the basic blocks or the local variables in there or like symbol names for local variables. So how can we specify our function in the, in the most basic way if we don't have the Gidra UI connected? Uh, we get the default code space from our architecture object and then uh, use this address space to create uh, an offset in there. As a starting address, we use uh, 0x1a16, which again is the entry point or like the, the, the main function of the Balcom batch in this case. Uh, the uh, end address doesn't have to be an actual end address, we just take the highest address of the code space because um, it will try to follow the flow of the function and then stop once it has found uh, all basic blocks and all returns and stuff like that. Then we define the function by getting the global scope object. We create the function in the global scope at the specified address and then we can use the function object that we get from the function symbol. And then finally, we can call follow flow, which will just call slay uh, continuously until it has found all the basic blocks uh, and disassembled and lifted everything to p-code. So what are we still missing for decompilation now? We have uh, disassembly uh, and we have the lifting to p-code. We have the function in, in memory and now Decompilation works by following a sequence of actions defined in Ghidra. Uh, and an action is a large scale transformation that works on the whole function. Uh, and it's just one part of the decompilation. And you can kind of chain these together and loop them. Uh, and they can be applied repeatedly until no, there is no uh, change possible anymore, which is uh, like a typical concept in compilers. Sometimes you just uh, apply transformations until you don't see any changes happening anymore. The main method of an action is the apply method. Uh, it can test first if it wants to apply or not. Uh, and just like uh, return non-zero if it, if it is not applied. There is also a mechanism for debugging. You can actually specify breakpoints so that you can uh, check what your actions are doing or, or how your actions are interacting with other actions. Uh, or you just return zero if everything went fine. 
we can chain actions together sequentially by putting them into an action group. So uh, the, the action group itself is also an action, so you can kind of like uh, do this like Matroshka dolls um, stacking of actions inside action groups, uh, which are then executed sequentially. Uh, and we also have an action restart group, but this is only used once because you need to set the attribute on the function itself. So if you want to restart an action, you can set set restart pending on the function object. Uh, but because this is like global for the function object, you can't really use it besides using it for the top level analysis action. So using the action restart group basically means we want to restart the whole analysis because uh, we changed something that all the other analysis uh, are going to depend on. To do more fine-grained stuff than actions, because actions operate on the whole function, uh, we also have rules. Rules operate on p-code uh, opcodes itself, or more like can match specific opcodes. You can still modify the whole function, but you can match specific p-code opcodes. And you can uh, put these into a pool, and an action pool, which is surprisingly not for actions, but for rules. Uh, but it will just take the rules uh, and apply them repeatedly uh, until there are no changes anymore. Uh, yes. The way actions are defined in Ghidra, uh, the actions constitute the, the decompilation pipeline itself. Uh, and you have a top level action, which is the universal action. And this contains all the other actions that exist inside the Gitter decompiler. And picking specific, a, a specific decompilation pipeline or uh, a different process works now by uh, going through the universal action and select, uh, select the actions that actually have matching names uh, for the things that you want to do. Let's see. Let's take a look at what this looks like inside the code. So basically, in this source file, coreaction.cc, at the very end, at least, yeah, it's, it's the very end, uh, we have the universal action function, which just initializes the universal action. And then we can go through uh, and check, like, these are all actions that the decompiler can perform in theory. Uh, and this is a very long list. Uh, here we have the, the different rewriting rules. And currently, there is not really a high-level overview on how these actions interact with each other, uh, which, make it, which, which makes it a bit hard to actually add new actions into this without actually breaking uh, a lot, until, uh, unless you know what you're doing. What's more interesting for us is this here, which defines the default groups that are also used by the Gira decompiler. Here we see we have the group decompile, jump table, normalize, uh, param ID, register, and first pass. And these specify all the other actions that are going to be executed if we, for example, specify decompile. And we can just uh, tell uh, the action database we want to execute the decompile group, and then it will select all actions that actually match uh, the members that are listed in here. So here we see, for example, we have, we have certain base actions base actions are pretty much always executed. And here we see uh, certain uh, actions that are tagged with the base name. Uh, this looks pretty complicated, but using it is actually pretty easy because all we need to do is uh, we need to go into the architecture and the, uh, the actions because the architecture has all the actions stored as well. Uh, and we set the current action to decompile, uh, and then we perform the current action. And that will decompile the code, but it won't print it yet. Uh, it will 
do all the transformations on the P code, but we still have to go ahead uh, and actually print it in something. And this is the last step in the decompilation pipeline, which is the print language interface, where we just specify what we want to print. Uh, there's two implementations in Gidra. I don't know how well the print Java works, but technically Gidra can decompile Java code or to Java. Uh, and the main one is print C. If you want to implement your own uh, language to decompile to, you pretty much have to go ahead and implement all these actions here for all possible P-code operations uh, and then emit the tokens uh, that you want to show up in Gidra finally. Uh, so doing this from scratch is probably a lot of work, but you should be able to get uh, off ground by just going ahead and taking the print uh, C one and trying to modify that a bit. This is also where you find uh, in my opinion, some of the best documentation on how certain things work, because uh, the, the, the best way to find out how var nodes are encoded, for example, here we have uh, an operation for a call, a call instruction in P-code, and here we get the first argument of the call instruction, and this is a var node. And I was trying to figure out how the the symbol is encoded because I wanted the symbol name of the function. And the way this actually works is you need to go ahead and check the address space and check if the type of the address space is pointer function specification. And then you go ahead. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that, that's a bit hidden because all you need to do is you take address, get offset, so you get the offset of the address, and you just cast it to the C++ object here. And then you have the, the function spec, of which also has the name of the function. Uh, using print language is fortunately very easy. Again, uh, we can just set the output stream, and then we can call doc function. So this is pretty much uh, everything that we had on the, on the slides. We have, again, the same raw loader that I used earlier. Uh, now we have the raw arch, which just uh, has the, the architecture implementations that were on the slides as well. Uh, so there's not really anything special here. We, we start off, uh, we let Git reinitialize everything with uh, the start decompiler library function provided by libdecomp. You just need to pass it the, the home directory of Gidra, like the installation directory, so it can find the SLA files. Then you can in initialize the architecture with the file name in my case, and the, the string that describes the architecture that you, wanna, um, that you wanna use for disassembling. You can find this when you, when you look at the Gidra project. Uh, and you just go about program, and it's a bit small here, but uh, the, ar the architecture that is chosen, for example, in Gitra uh, here is x86, uh, and you can take this string and use it as an identifier for the architecture that you want to load. Then we just call init on the architecture. We define our function, our main function. We follow the flow for disassembly and lifting, we do the decompilation action, and then we document the function. And we get a successful function decompilation. So we have a lot of unreachable blocks here because something that I didn't do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have these things here uh, and these are actually at peripheral addresses, so these should be volatile, but they aren't marked volatile in the address space. 
because we don't have the information passed in. So it just like has many of these unreachable blocks because it thinks uh, these, these values are not volatile when they in reality really are. But besides that, it looks pretty much the same way. Uh, it looks in Ghidra when you have it uh, open the first time uh, and you navigate to the main function. The only thing uh, that you will see here is that we also don't have the type information specified because we just wanted a minimal version. So we have the x unknown too. So basically all we know is the, the length of the field. And that's about it. But other than that, it looks pretty much like the compilation we see also in the Java UI. OK. So the last thing, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Uh, a bit. I wanted to talk a bit about uh, writing your own custom uh, rewriting rules for P-code. Uh, this slide here just uh, has the information that you can also cache data. So normally, all the data that you want is stored in the func data object. But if you have an analysis that needs to store additional data that you don't want to recompute every time, you can also have a cache yourself in your rules and your actions. Uh, and there is a function that you can implement uh, reset, which will then reset uh, the things in, or where you should reset the things in your cache. Uh, here is also the link for the decomp viz that I showed earlier. Um, I'm just going to show the uh, a custom rewriting rule in the end, just for information, because this is relatively hard to get into. Like a lot of it is not documented, um, and even if you know how to do things. Sometimes things are uh, pretty hard to do inside the Gitra decompiler. So we're working uh, on a project called Reoxide, which is a project to work on Rust decompilation, so not directly the Gitra API. Uh, but the Rust decompilation is currently pretty ter terrible because we have a lot of things that just don't map very well to C uh, because the, the Rust compiler generates a lot of stuff. Uh, we received funding through, or we're going to receive funding through N the NGI Zero Interest project. Uh, and we're currently working on the first release. Uh, currently, the website, like nothing is there on the website except on the Gitra docs link that I showed earlier. You, you're not even going to be able to access it. Uh, and there's also a, a, an organization on Codeberg. So if you're interested in uh, seeing how this develops, you can check back here in October. The main milestones are going to be uh, working on a better Gitra, Gitra decompiler plugin API because currently you cannot like dynamically load the plugins as you would somewhat use in, in the Java interface. Uh, and we also want to provide a more robust interface that you can uh, use to make extensions to the decompiler easier. And then when it comes to the Rust-specific part, uh, we want to tackle like, certain things that don't map to, to C uh, very well currently in the current decompiler. Because uh, what Gitra doesn't handle very well and what was the motivation, or one of the motivation for these things, uh, in the first place, was uh, overlapping stack structs, because what Rust does is when it has, um, when it determines that certain memory on the stack is not used anymore, it will just reuse this for other stuff. And Gitra, the way it decompiles, it just assumes that a variable will always stay um, at the same stack location. So there's that. Uh, and we also have a lot of inlining and monomorphization, which we can't really tackle currently uh, with the way the decompiler works. And then the final milestone would be to decompile instead of uh, decompiling to C, to decompile something that would look more like Rust, like the uh, uh, middle intermediate representation. Uh, so thank you, I guess. Any questions? <laughs>